Hey guys, welcome back to Breakfast and Bible. I'm Ree, and today we are continuing this very sensitive topic, very emotional topic um, that we have started since the last Breakfast and Bible. If you missed it, please go back and watch it. Um, I do mean for these to go kind of together. Um, if you are new and you are unfamiliar um, with the channel with the topic we are currently doing a series on women of the bible and what it means to be a woman of god and so uh this chunk these next couple of episodes are focused in on the very very emotional and very triggering topics of sexual assault so if um you you know think that that might be something that's a little little too heavy for you um definitely probably this is not the video in the series to watch um because we will be discussing that topic and it is like i said a very emotional topic so wanted to get that disclaimer out in the open last week we talked about dinah or dina who was the daughter of jacob and this week we are going to talk about tamar so Guys, I told you guys last week, the story of Tamar is even more distressing than the story of Dina. I feel like each person that we learn about or the order in which that I'm telling you about them, it does get progressively worse. I wanted to start, there's no light, there's no light hearted story when you start talking about sexual assault, but I wanted to start, you know, I guess as as small as I could I don't know I, I I just didn't want to jump in off the deep end um partially for my own self and also for you guys the listeners so today we are cranking it up a notch and we're talking about Tamar so let me show you guys my notes and we'll have to uh zoom in and get a little bit of focus here uh, before we actually start talking about Tamar. I know I haven't shown you guys like sticker people in a while, so just another disclaimer. I do have these stickers that I've created for personal use. I can't sell them because I don't have the rights to the characters, but I use them just for imagery. This is not what Tamar looks like. This is not meant to represent Tamar. It's really just to cover white space in the journal for aesthetic purposes. So just want to give out that disclaimer uh, before anyone thinks that I'm actually trying to represent people of the Bible. I am a firm believer um, in just not because we don't know what they looked like. So that being said, Tamar is introduced to us in 2 Samuel chapter 13. I highly recommend you read the entire chapter for yourself. This episode will be way too long if I try to read it word for word and discuss it. So I'm going to leave that to you guys if you want to pause and go read it and come back or if you want to just read it after the fact, whichever works for you. Um, in the first couple of verses of the chapter, we learn a lot about Tamar's family tree. Now, I personally have made some assumptions in this uh, chart that I've drawn here. Um, it is very clear that, well, also, I've also forgotten to finish writing a name. Sorry, guys. This is what happens. This is really what happens when you're, when you're doing stuff and you make mistakes and you white it out and you come back. So just letting you guys see the real process. This is meant to say Absalom. Okay, so, huh, family tree. Um, so I personally have made the assumption that Tamar and Absalom are full blood and sister because throughout the chapter, um, both in the beginning, it says that Absalom had a sister and then, it ref and then Amnon refers to Tamar as Absalom's sister. So assumably Ammon, and Absalom are half brothers and Tamar is the sister of Absalom making her the half sister of Amnon and if you go further back in 2nd Samuel you'll learn that uh, Maka and 
Ahinoam, I'm not sure how to pronounce these names, but these are the mothers of Absalom and Amnon, respectively. So um, I drew this with the assumption that Tamar is also the daughter of Maka, and that is why this family tree looks like this. It is very possible that Tamar and Absalom were also half-siblings. David had a lot of wives, a lot of concubines. Not really sure. Um, this, like, the language could have been more so of Amnon distancing himself from the fact that that is his sister as well. Um, and not so much of a statement of Tamar's kinship to Absalom specifically. But... I, I just want to point that out that I have made the assumption that uh, she was the full sister of Absalom. Nonetheless, one thing that we can know without a certainty, I mean, without a shadow of doubt, with certainty, is that she was the daughter of David. She is referred to as the sister of both Absalom and the sister of Amnon without, with, throughout the pa uh, passage, which means she's also the sister of Solomon. Um, and so we know for a fact that she is the daughter of David through one of his wives. And the first thing that we're told about her is that she was very fair. We're told that she's very beautiful. Um, this is kind of in contrast to Dina, who we're not told anything about. But Tamar is a very lovely woman or girl. And when we meet her, she is actually still a virgin, which means that she is not married. Um, so she would have been fairly young. Um, there are all kinds of debates about how young that was, but um, on my blog, I have listed a more in-depth uh, anal analysis of this passage, um, as always, and I'll link it uh, in the description below. But in there, I also have linked to some studies showing that the age of maturity uh, well, through puberty, I should say the age of puberty, more specifically in women has decreased over time. So likely Tamar would have been much older than we are today when she became, you know, considered a woman. Uh, so that also raises the age at which she would have gotten married. Uh, so we don't really know exactly how old Tamar is, but if I had to guess, I would have said that she was in her mid to late teens when this happened, um, because that's usually around the time that women do uh, experience puberty, and that is the time traditionally that women were getting married in ancient times. So the fact that she's not married yet, I don't really foresee her being like 20, 25, things like that. So, you know somewhere probably between like 15 and 18-ish um, is probably how old she was when this happened. Now, her brother Amnon became extremely obsessed with her. And it was to the point that he became sick. The Bible says that he was ill um, and that he started losing weight because he was obsessing about having his sister. Uh, which is really, really bizarre. And, um, you know, I wrote a note to myself asking, like, did he actually have a mental illness? Because it seems very, um, you know, I mean, obviously from a modern lens, the whole sister thing is one, one problem in and of itself. It's like, dude, you're over here fantasizing and obsessing over your sister. Like, that's, that's weird enough as it is. But to obsess over someone to the point that you're losing weight, um, that seems like an obsessive compulsive disorder or like a possessive disorder or something. I am not a psychologist, so I cannot diagnose anybody, but it just seems very much not healthy. We'll put it like that. Um, and so when he expresses this to someone, he expresses it to a close friend of his who is actually his first cousin. It is the son of one of David's uh, brothers. So it's his first cousin. And, you know, a good friend would have been like, dude, you need help. We, we're, you know, we're going to take you out on the town. We're going to introduce you to some nice girls. You are a prince of Israel, we're going to introduce you to all the girls and get your mind right. And you're going to forget about your sister 
and find one of these other lovely young ladies to continue your life with. That is what a good friend would say. This man was not a good friend. He followed this guy up and helped him to plot on how to take advantage of Tamar, which is crazy because this is also his cousin, right? We're, we're it's all in the family. Families be causing some problems, but they get together and they come up with this elaborate scheme where Amnon is gonna pretend to be sick, even though he's clearly sick up here already. Like he's not pretending, but, but he pretends to be like physically sick. And he asks for Tamar to be the one to take care of him. She comes and she's being a dutiful sister. And while she is taking care of him, he sends away all of the people that are in the room with them who probably don't think anything of it considering that they are siblings. And um, during this time when they are alone, he does first ask for permission to have sex with her, but she rejects it on the account of many things. Um, and when she rejects him, he just decides to do it anyway. So he takes advantage of her, he rapes her, and then afterwards, he hates her, which is a very interesting thing. I, I want to focus on Tamar, so I'm not going to derail the conversation to talk about all of the weird things going on with Amnon, because that, that whole thing is very, we could have like a whole conversation about that too. Um, but the point is, after all of this, Tamar is very distraught, and we actually get to see Tamar's distress, unlike Dina back in Genesis. Now, before we talk about Tamar's distress, I do want to point out that there are multiple issues happening in this passage, right? Amnon, first and foremost, Amnon has raped someone, and that is not okay, right? There is, that is a problem. That is probably the most egregious thing that he has done uh, in, in the chapter. But on top of that, he's also had sex with his sister, which is expressly forbidden in Leviticus 18. This is a long passage that talks about what is and isn't appropriate sexual conduct for the Israelites um, and sex with your sister, whether it's your, even if it's your, just your half sister, regardless of which parent is the one who makes you guys related, it is forbidden. Now we know that Abraham married his sister Cain and Abel and Seth married their sisters. Um, but eventually God was like, y'all gotta stop marrying within. And that has to do with the denigration of our DNA. And again, that's a whole nother topic and conversation. But by the time that they were in the wilderness and Moses was pinning the law for them, God had put his foot down and said, okay, let's, that's not for y'all don't be marrying your, your, your sisters and your brothers and things like that. So by the time we get to David, by the time we get to Tamar, it is established that they're not to be marrying their siblings and they're not to be having sex with their siblings. So Amnon has breached the law here. Um, there's also the issue that this is premarital sex, even if it had been consensual, there would be an issue with the fact that they were not married and the fact that they were not married meant that he was then required to marry her which is actually really the only basis that we have that premarital sex was in fact against the law is that if you had sex with a woman who was not betrothed well if you had sex with a woman who was betrothed then that was considered adultery and you were supposed to be killed and if you had sex with a woman who was not betrothed then you were supposed to marry her which implies that you're supposed to be married to a woman or a man to have sex with them. So in this case, he fell under the case of sleeping with a woman who was not married, who was a virgin. So he was supposed to marry her if, the if she and the father consented. And he was supposed to pay the bride price or the price of virgins, whether they accepted the marriage or not. And when he gets angry and sends her out, he is essentially refusing this duty and refusing to pay for the bride price. And the reason I wanted to go through these, this list of transgressions that Amnon has committed is because this, this final one is something that is 
very different than what we have in our society today. And I think personally, when I look at the story, it adds so much more sorrow to what Tamar was going through. So in our society today, there, I mean, obviously, if you experience something like this, there's trauma, there's emotional trauma, there's physical trauma, um, there's spiritual trauma, because everything affects us, you know, in, in on the spiritual realm as well. There may be even mental trauma that you experience from such a thing. And that in and of itself is heartbreaking enough and hard enough to cope with. But we live in a society that is a little bit more forgiving um, of people, of women. We live in a society where people aren't necessarily expected to be virgins when they get married. Um, in fact, it's kind of hard to date. Um, there are many men who will not date women who will not have sex with them before marriage. So there is, you know, it, we live in a very different society than, than Tamar did. But in Tamar's day, men would not marry women who were not virgins. So when it got out that, you know, her brother had violated her, even though she was technically a princess, her ability to marry would have basically crumbled into nothing. So her future as, you know, to be a wife, to be a mother is also being taken from her in one shot. But even beyond that, this was the era where women weren't really allowed to just go out and, and make a life for themselves. It was considered weird. Um, while women did have the right to own things and they did uh, do things, a lot of this was still tied to having a husband. So for instance, we see that the Proverbs 31 woman buys property and we see that Moses rules that uh, Zelophehad's daughters are able to inherit his property. But in each case, there's still the mentioning of a husband. There is really no mentioning of a single woman owning property and, and feeding herself and just living her best life without a husband in the Bible. That was not how things operated in ancient times. And we see this with Ruth and Naomi. Ruth is a widow and she and Naomi have to secure their livelihood. That is why she is there gleaning the fields. And that is why they're approaching Boaz because otherwise they will be destitute and they will be poor. So women's livelihood was also tied to having a spouse. So it's not just you're not going to be able to experience this grand love. You're not going to be able to have kids, but you're also going to be destitute. And you've lived your life as a princess your whole life. And all of this is taken from you in an instance because this man is acting a plum fool and has lost his mind. So I think obviously it's easy enough without that context to understand why Tamar would be upset, but adding that layer of context and understanding what it would have been like to be a woman during Tamar's time, it just makes it all the more egregious and all the more heavy. So we're given Tamar's reaction and Tamar first basically pleads for him to marry her because she knows all of these things. And I think that's another reason why I wanted to point out, this is why she's saying it's better that you, you marry me. Like she's saying, it, she says it's worse for him to reject her and not marry her than the actual act of violating her in the first place. Um, and that is because that is a lifelong sentence for her. In addition to that, she tears her clothes. We see this throughout the Bible. Um, if you read, for instance, like the King James Version, it'll say something like rent your clothes. Uh, more of the modern translations will probably say tore or ripped or something like that. But basically in ancient times, what they would do is they would basically like shred their clothes or te tear their clothes as a sign of mourning. People did this at, during death. People did this uh, when, I think there were a couple of prophets who did this to make a point. Um, so Tamar is, is expressing grief and she is expressing mourning by tearing her clothes. And she had like a special robe um, that was, that she had torn. Um, 
She also places ashes on her head. This is another sign of mourning from ancient culture. And then she goes out in the street and cries out. Now, I think this crying out, I think there is so many things about this. I mean, obviously she's just been assaulted. So it makes sense that she is crying out and that she's crying. She probably, you know, there again, emotional and physical pain coming out. But also there is a verse that we will talk about when we talk about the law in which um, there is some, some tricky wording there about women being assaulted in the city versus in the country and this, this notion of crying out for help. And so Tamar crying out is also indicative that she did not allow this to happen to her for those who are around, right? So her crying out is to alert those around that she did not go willingly into this situation, I believe. Um, and then of course is also a sign of mourning for the distress and the duress that she's in. Now in the midst of all of this, we find out that it is her other brother, her brother that I have assumed is her full brother, that comes to the rescue. Now I'm not sure if Absalom was just wandering by and saw her in this state of distress and this was like right after the fact or if this was like a couple of days later we're not really told the timeline of this but absalom when he sees her he immediately knows what has happened so it must not have been a secret that amnon would have this obsession with tamar um, and absalom is furious we don't see this fury as his first reaction though and i think that's really important Absalom's first reaction is to take care of Tamar. And now his words may not be the best words ever. You know, he tells her, you know, not to make a fuss, but to, you know, that he will take care of her. And arguably reading this as an adult here, you know, reading, you know, don't, you know, don't make a fuss or don't, you know, don't, I guess, go on about it. It sounds very condescending, but also as a person who's lived a little more life, um, I also understand that sometimes we don't know what to say. I don't necessarily think he was saying, you know, don't tell anybody, let's keep it a secret, let's sweep it under the rug, you know, get over it. I think he was trying to remove the pressure from her and he took it onto himself. I think he provided her with a safe space, which is one thing that she really needed. He was giving her security and stability that Ab that Amnon had took taken from her. Um, but I think he was also saying, like, don't worry yourself about bringing this matter up. I'm going to take it. I'm going to make sure he get what coming to him. You just, you know, try to find peace within yourself. And it's I don't know if anyone who has never experienced, you know, sexual assault, that type of violation can truly understand what it's like. And I think that may be why his his words come off a little off putting. But I do think his intentions were pure because of what happens in the aftermath. Right. So at some point, all of this gets back to David, whether Tamar has told David or whether Absalom has told David, somebody told David, and David is also angry. But David doesn't do anything. Now we see Absalom takes the first step and says, you can come live with me. I'll take care of you. You know, I'm going to try to comfort you. We don't see anything that says David went to Tamar and, you know, or David provided housing for Tamar or anything like that. Now that doesn't mean that he didn't go to her, but we're not told of David actively doing anything or punishing Amnon or anything. And that very well could be because David had his own skeletons. I mean, David is the man who ended up taking Bathsheba, taking another man's wife, then having the man killed because he got her pregnant and all this other stuff. So David was probably, you know, it, it's the pot calling the kettle black, right? The apple didn't fall far from the tree. We're going to talk about Bathsheba later on and, and the act of consent, considering David was a king. Um, so arguably, David may not have had the moral high ground to punish Amnon. And Absalom is not happy about that. So two years after the incident, Absalom comes up with a plan and plot to have Amnon killed, which he succeeds. 
So, so Absalom is the one who executes vengeance on behalf of Tamar and gets Amnon killed for his actions. Now, I don't know if he took so long because it took him that long to figure out how to do it. I don't know if he was trying to lull him into a false sense of security or if this was some sort of negotiation with David where he expected David to step in and he expected David to take over and, and execute the punishment. I'm not sure. But two years after the fact, Absalom made sure that Amnon paid for his actions. Um, and in the aftermath of that, though, he ends up fleeing, um, probably in fear that someone else would take vengeance upon him. And it's interesting because we get David's reaction to this. And David is not angry with Absalom for killing Amnon. So it seems that David knew that this should be done or that David was in agreement. Like he was like, you know, Amnon got what he deserved, but he just wasn't the one able to do it. It's very tricky. David's David's reaction to both the the situation to Absalom and and subsequently as things progress because this starts a huge rift between Absalom and David um ends up you know Absalom ends up trying to overthrow David that's a topic for another day but the reaction that David has just kind of comes and goes that makes me wonder what was going on with David uh in the midst of all of this confusion um and the other thing that I wondered was if the rest of his sons knew what happened between Amnon and Tamar because when Absalom has Amnon killed he invites everybody he doesn't just invite Amnon probably because Amnon probably knew that Absalom hated him so Amnon probably wouldn't have went if it was just the two of them but he invites everyone so presumably Solomon is there and all of his other brothers and they're out having a good time and drinking and you know, doing what the men folks do. And when Amnon gets drunk, Absalom has his servants kill Amnon. So when the other brothers realize that Amnon is dead, they flee. Which tells me that they didn't realize that this was a personal grudge. It's very possible that they thought Absalom was making a run for the throne and was getting rid of all of his competition. So... You know, it's it's one of those things that makes me wonder how much the rest of the family knew um, if it was just something that was between Tamar, Absalom, David, and uh, Amnon, or if this was widely known throughout their family. Um, and it also makes me wonder, you know, if this might have been kept on the hush-hush in the hopes that, you know, they could still secure her a, a husband who might look the other way at the fact that she wasn't a virgin. I mean, she, again, she is a princess. So um, marrying into the royal family does have its perks. You, you know, she may have not been completely doomed. Unfortunately, we are not told the fate of Tamar after the fact, like so many women in the Bible, we just get, you know, this, this small snippet of her story um, we're not told if she does ever find a husband. Even after Absalom runs away after killing Amnon, we're not told if she also goes with Absalom. Um, he goes to hide out with his grandfather. We don't know if she stays in Jerusalem. We don't know if, you know, like what actually happens there. Like after Absalom dies, does she inherit Absalom's home or... Did, was she on the street? Did David finally give her a place to stay? Did she find a husband? Did she have kids? None of this information is given to us. However, we do find out that Absalom has a daughter who he names after Tamar. So Absalom has a daughter named Tamar as well, um, which says a lot about the bond between the brother and sister. It's um, even though it's a very tragic story, it is a beautiful story of brother and sister love and having um, someone's back um, in in the midst of turmoil. Um, and because 
Amnon refused to do the right thing. Um, I believe that Absalom may have been justified in his actions. I'm not, again, I'm not saying that if someone commits sexual assault that they should die. But given the laws that were there, I, I don't necessarily think that Absalom was unjustified in what he was doing. Um, again, in comparison to Dina's brothers who slaughtered an entire town, Absalom just got the one person who did what was wrong. He didn't even go kill the friend who gave Amnon the idea in the first place. Um, so, you know, I think it was definitely a much more restrained type of vengeance. Um, but again, the reason that I want to go through these stories and to talk about them is to point out the fact that both David and Absalom are aware that Tamar is wronged, right? That Tamar has been wronged and that Amnon is the problem. We do not get any sort of insinuation that, well, she shouldn't have gone to help him or she shouldn't, she, you know, she shouldn't have been so pretty or any of these types of things. It's very much made clear that the aggressor is the problem um, and that someone is standing up for her. It's also, in this case, a tale of what happens when you ignore justice, when you don't deliver justice. So David could have done something to Amnon. He didn't necessarily have to kill him, but he could have done something to rebuke him and to um, punish him for what he has done. But David doesn't. He stays in the side of neutrality and he does not execute judgment. And because he doesn't execute judgment, he ends up putting that burden upon Absalom, who takes it into his own hands and subsequently ends up challenging David for the throne. This ends up being kind of a mini civil war type of a thing, like a coup d'etat. And many people actually end up dying in the skirmish between David and Absalom. And those people didn't have to die. And I highly doubt that Absalom would have challenged David for the throne if David had just taken action when he had the chance, if he had executed justice the way he was supposed to. So ultimately, the story of Tamar, I believe, is not just about, you know, the, the hardships and the, the hurt and the pain, it is definitely there. It is definitely something that, um, you know, I think many people could relate to and could be used to discuss the heavy topics. But I also think it's a story about the perversion of justice and how justice is important, that God has called us to do justice. And if you are in a position of power and something happens, even if it's your child, even if you are close to the situation, even if you are at risk of having to admit your own hypocrisy and admit your own detriment, you know, your own skeletons, you have the responsibility to execute justice at all times. So that is what I got from the story of Tamar. And that is what I wanted to bring to you guys. As always, um, I appreciate you guys sticking around and listening. Um, if you are a survivor of sexual assault, uh, my heart goes out to you and I hope that you are well and that you are able to find someone that you trust and someone that you love that you can talk to and that you can um, heal with. And so with that being said, I will see you guys at the next Breakfast and Bible and I hope you have a great week.